you, Lord Jesus. Good morning. I'm going to pray. Father, I just thank you for this time, and I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that guides, guides me and teaches me what I should say, Father. I'm led by your Spirit. I thank you, Father, for all your people that are here this morning and listening in, for their wonderful hearts that are ready to receive your word, your seed. And I pray from this seed that you planted, harvest will come in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Harvest is coming. Amen? It's coming up. Guys, we were talking about gardening this morning, right, at the, over breakfast, and it takes a lot of work to do gardening, amen? But what's the first thing you got to do? You got to plant seed, right? Because what ha- you have to have good soil. That, thank you. You have to have good soil. You have to plant the seed. And how many of you know, even if you don't plant seed, something may grow in that soil, and it might not be good. That's right. It'll be weeds. See, that's just like our hearts, amen? Our heart is the soil and yes we have to have a good heart and thank you jesus for coming into our heart and preparing the soil and making it good amen that's why without jesus in our hearts without that good soil it's going to be hard to plant good good things because ain't nothing going to grow right except weeds and that's bad news amen oh thank you lord okay yeah we're going to be talking a lot this morning about our heart you know, it's, it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, for those of you who've known me for a long time, I've done many teachings on the heart. And I might even have on YouTube right now something about a heart condition, you know, or uh, issues of the heart or our heart, something. There's, I know I've done a teaching before on the heart, but over the years since when we taught way back in the days with the youth, I used to talk about the heart. Because the heart is the heartbeat of our lives, amen, the heartbeat of us. Without our heart, are we going to live? No. If our heart dies, we're done, right? But our brain could die, and we could still live on. Our heart could still beat. They could hook us up to a machine, and we don't have to use our brain to live. It's clear, the people that are out there, that you don't have to use your brain (laughs) to live, (laughs) amen? Okay, we agree on that. So it's a heart thing, okay? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today is our heart. And I'm going to be talking about that good ground and that soil. And I look around here this morning, and every person who's here this morning has the soil. They, you guys have the good stuff, right? Because each one of you has Jesus in your heart. So he's there, and he's ready. He's prepared your heart. So all you need is the seed, amen? And the seed is the word of God. And God is good. If any of you were listening in on Wednesday night to Pastor's message, you know, he's been going through for several weeks now The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And the chapter that he was on was having a lot to do with the way that we think, right? And if you guys have, you know, been in church for any length of time, I remember back in the, in the 90s, I remember we, used, we had this guest speaker come to our church, and his whole message to us was about the way that we think and how we have stinking thinking. Back in those days, that was the terminology. Get rid of the stinking thinking, right? And, um, and he was talking a lot about strongholds. Again, if you've been in the church, that's a Christianese word that many people who don't go to church don't understand that word stronghold, but it is in the Bible, and stronghold has to do with something that has a hold of your mind, okay? Um, you often hear pastors say, practice the same old ways, you get the same old results. And the bottom line is there are many of us who have been Christians for a long time, you know, 20 and 30 years, and it's like not too much has changed in our life. And you got to ask yourself, am I practicing the same old ways? What, you know, or, or are you happy with the status quo? Are you happy where you are? You know, it's good enough. Um, everybody lives their life differently, Amen. Let's go to the book of Romans 12, 2. And Romans 12, 2 is a key scripture. It's a principal scripture when it comes to the Christian life. You know, back in the days, you used to hear people who would talk about Christians, and they have several names for people who go to church regularly. They they call them... Bible thumpers, right? They call them uh, holy rollers. You know, they call them, uh, 
you know, they say that they're brainwashed, okay? And I remember when I was young, I used to hear those things, you know, believe it or not, I'm going to put my mom on the spot for a minute here. When my dad first started going to church, because he went to church for about 14 years before my mom joined him, okay? But during those 14 years, she was one of those people that would look at him and say, yeah, right, you ain't changed. I don't believe it, you know? And she used to say, you know, she used to say, uh, you know, she just, she just doubted him and there was no trust there. 14 years. She was a little hesitant, you'd say, right? Some people might say, <laughs> some people might say, you know, I tr I'll see if they've changed after a year. Okay. Now I'm going to put my mother-in-law on the spot. Nancy, she had a, a brother-in-law, Manuel, right? And he went to, to church and he changed his life for about five years. Then did 360, went right back to where he was. Now, remember I said earlier, usually you might give somebody a year to see if they've changed. He was in church for five years. So you know when Elias and I started going to church, she looked at Elias and she said, yeah, right. <laughs> she said, we'll see. And why does she say that? Because she didn't believe it. Because there is a guy who's sold out for God, him and his wife, five years. We're talking about, you know, ex-drug addicts, heroin addicts, and, and, and we're talking about they were in church, you know, every time you turned around and they were speaking the Christianese and, you know, they were living the life, right? And then what happened? Well, something happened and they were back to where they were. So you see how it doesn't matter time, how long you've been serving God. That's not what makes the difference. The difference is, is do you believe? Nancy, it's been over 20 years now. Do you believe <laughs> that Elias has changed? <laughs> Funny I say that. And you're going to be in the second row. And I said, yeah, right. And where am I? <laughs> in the second row. So you praise God. Praise God. When she said that, I, I was just going to say, actually, it was 16 years. But the thing is, the, no, the thing is, is that when I became a Christian, I was so sad that I wasted all that time. I knew I wasted it because the last 10 years of our life, together we uh, we were both serving the lord and it was the best time of our lives amen amen, amen. and and you know and and then she believed that he changed and nancy believes that her son has changed and and and, and once again do you know we know pastors who have served for 20 and 30 years and they still fell from grace see it doesn't matter the time we you can't trust man you know what I mean? We're going to let you down. Pastors are going to let you down. We're human. You know, we might say something from the pulpit that might hurt your feelings, and we're not intending to hurt your feelings. Believe me, it's not a personal vendetta when we're up here preaching. I mean, we're believing that God is leading us to say what we're saying. I mean, we've studied. We've prayed. This, we don't take this lightly. You know what I mean? And sometimes people do come to our mind, and we're like, no, no, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, purposely say. And you'll hear pastors say many times, you know, I'm not talking about anyone in this church. You know, when they're, when they're giving an example of someone that they were counseling or that they, you know, they have to put that disclosure out there because everybody's lives are so similar and they go through similar things that when the pastors are talking about certain situations, everybody's like, oh, it's talking about me. You know, I know they're talking about me. Oh, I'm not going back. I'm here preaching to me from the pulpit. You know, don't take it. That's God talking to you. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you, not trying to bring condemnation. That's a big difference. Because condemnation is, the enemy brings condemnation. He's the accuser of the brethren, and he's the one who comes and whispers those lies into your ears and, and says to you, they're probably saying this about you. They're probably talking about you. They're probably, you know, conspiracy against you. That's the enemy, you know. And, and, and when, you know, when, when, when you don't know what somebody's doing and thinking and, you know, and it, it's the enemy playing with your mind. See, he has no power. I'm going to jump ahead of myself for just a second. Let's go to, um, let's go over to the book of, of uh, Matthew, chapter 28. 
I'm sorry, did I even read Romans 12, 2? I'm sorry. Okay, you guys have to keep one, one place and the other place. 12, 2 was about renewing your mind, okay? The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. What does transform mean? It means to change. So don't be conformed. Don't fall into what the world is doing. Don't go with the status quo, the trends, the don't, don't do it. It's, it's, there's a reason for that. And I, that, I could go in a whole other direction with that message, but just heed the warning for now. Don't do it, but keep working on changing your mind. And see, so you, you heard me earlier talking about being brainwashed. You know, if I got to be brainwashed by the word and God, I'm going to do it. It's the best thing. He's my creator. He knows how I tick. Why would I want to be brainwashed by someone other than or something other than? Why would I want to be brainwashed by this world and where the devil runs rampantly and tries to rule and reign? But it's not about him. It's about God because I know that God is looking out for me. He's my heavenly father. He loves me unconditionally. There's not anything that he wouldn't do. He wants me to succeed. He's on my side. I'm more than a conqueror through, G- through Jesus. This is my God. So why wouldn't I want to be brainwashed by him? I'll give you a little, little side story. Um, my mom always shares with me. When I was little and going to start kindergarten, I was the only one. Well, I did go to tiny tot school, but I didn't go to preschool. Um, my brothers got to go to preschool. The twins know that because they went to t- preschool together. And so um, I didn't go to preschool. I went to tiny tot school, and then that was it. Then I just started kindergarten. But my dad used to tell my mom, I don't want to send her to school because then she's going to start learning other stuff, other stuff than what we want her to learn and want and have been teaching her. And I always find that interesting because isn't it just like that as parents? We want to groom our kids. I mean, look at dads. Why do they all want a son most of the time? They want a son. Why? Because they want that mini me, you know? I was listening to that song by Will Smith, Just the Two of Us. And what he's, you know, he's singing about his son and he's saying, you know, you know, that he, he tries to discipline him, but he laughs because he makes him laugh and he's just like him. And they're so proud of that little mini me being, you know what I mean? Well, God is very proud of us and his creation and he loves us so much and he wants the best for us just like a loving parent would. But the bottom line is we get exposed to this world. Okay, now let's think for a minute. In Genesis 127, the Bible says that we were made in his image. Okay, we're made in God's image. We're just like him. And in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, what does it say? It says God is love. Love is God. Now, if we're made in his image, we're love, like God, because we're made in his image. So what does that mean? That means that when the Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, In another version, it says perfectly made. When the Bible says that about us, about you, and about me, we're made in his image, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, we're made perfect in him. How is that? Right? And then what happens? We get into a womb, right? We get into a person with free will, stomach, and we start growing in that environment. And what are we hearing? Because they say that a baby can hear in the womb. You know what I used to do? I used to put the stylistics to my stomach. And I used to play it for Ronnie when she was in my womb. Because the song that says, you are everything and everything to me. You know, I wanted her to know that from the womb. That that's how important she was to me. And that song greatly expressed the way I felt about this child I hadn't even met yet. But I loved her that much. And that's where I started with her. But what, do, what are other people nurturing their kids? What kind of environment? You know, I like to talk about when I was um, pregnant, you know, I stopped drinking, stopped smoking, stopped, you know. But I was there at the party, okay? I was there, and I was in that environment, and the music was playing, and the people were talking, and the drinking and the smoking was going on around me. And what do they say about secondhand smoke now? Thank God for the blood of Jesus, amen? But what I'm saying is it starts when you get in the womb that your world, you as a being, are being created 
And I'm not trying to bring condemnation. Again, none of us were perfect. None of us knew any of this. Again, thank God for the blood of Jesus. Amen? But we didn't know this back in those days. And we didn't know that when that child was born, we didn't know it didn't come with an instruction manual. And we didn't do everything right. And I know there's parents out there who want to put their kids in a bubble, like the boy in the plastic bubble. You young kids will not know about that movie. (laughs) It's where John Travolta (laughs) got one of his first big roles, right? The boy in the plastic bubble. That's the way we want to treat our kids, and we don't want them to go off to school, and we don't want them to go off and be around other people, and we don't want, you know, we're, we're, we're scared for them. But they were made in God's image too. And so the bottom line is we are wired for love the way that we think and the way that we are. But it's everything that has come into our life that has changed us and molded us and made us who we are. And sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's not so good. And the bottom line is, when the Bible tells us in Romans 12, 2, to be transformed, it means to be changed, changed from who you were and what you were doing, to now be changed to being in the image of God, the way that God created you. So a lot of people, they can't get with that because they're so worldly, they can't even wrap their mind around it. But the Bible says to do it, and it's for your benefit. Again, that's another message, but let's move forward. I had you guys jump over to um, Matthew. We were looking at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And if you remember, this is after Jesus has already been crucified and, and, you know, he came and, and he was talking to the disciples. And it says here that Jesus came... And he said unto them, All power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And in some versions, instead of the word power, it says all authority. So Jesus, if Jesus has all authority and power, okay, this is after the cross. So if he has all the authority and power, what power does Satan have? None. Satan has no power. But we give him power. And I could explain that, again, a whole nother message. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you the way, the environment that we have come out of, the worldly ways that we have learned, everything that, that we have been taught, Satan had a hand in a lot of that. Okay? So when... When God's, God's word says to renew your mind, it's because you need to clean that out. You need to reboot. Have any of you ever got a virus on your phone or on your computer? What do you have to do? You have to get it cleaned out. Somebody has to professionally come and clean out your computer. They have to get rid of those viruses. That's where we are right now, you see. And every so often, when you least expect it, a virus or bug is popping up in our life. And you could tell because of the way your life is going, the way that you're handling situations, the things that are coming out of your mouth, the thoughts that you're having in your head, right? And you're thinking, how did I get this way? How can I make it better? Well, guess what? You got to work on renewing your mind. How does an athlete get to be in the profession he's in. How does an Olympic gold medalist get to win that gold medal? Anybody have any clue? Do they sit on the couch and eat bonbons all day? Do they sleep all day? Do they ignore their workout or their craft, whatever it is, practice it maybe once a month? No, they don't. It's a daily disciplined Regiment, it's a lifestyle for them. Many of them live and breathe what it is that they do. So, going back to your chaotic life, or this all hell has broken loose, or, you know, whatever. How can you handle this? We need to reboot. We need to get to church. We need to read our Bible. We need to spend time with God. We need to practice, practice, practice what we're reading, what we're hearing, and what we're saying. Man, 
what we're saying that's such a big thing you know there's a lot of people who learn how to say the right things to people you know and they think because they've learned to say the right things I'll give you the example of christianese right when we speak christianese where do we speak it at church where the other christians can understand us but do you speak christianese at work sometimes some people do <laughs> And those are the people that seem to be annoying to the rest of the world because they're like, that's when they're like, oh, that holy roller, that Bible thumper, that, you know, she's brainwashed, that, you know, she's not in, living in reality, right? But the truth is they're not living in reality. But the bottom line is just because you learn how to speak Christianese doesn't always mean that your life, the fruit that's coming from your life is reflecting what you say and who you say that you are and who you say that you belong to, right? It's a very almost walking on a tightrope kind of a situation, but it shouldn't be because if you want to be good at what God is calling you to be, the person who he's calling you to be and the plan that he's given you for your life and the purpose that you are here on this earth, if you want to be good at it, you've got to be renewing your mind daily. It's a daily discipline and it's a commitment. And a lot of people don't like that word. I mean, again, a whole nother message, okay? But it's a lifestyle. And the truth is, we have Jesus. I established that in the beginning. Every person here, we all have Jesus. And with Jesus, he said it, all power has been given unto me. So the devil doesn't have power. So you could blame him for all the situations in your life. But the truth is, is the devil has no power. So how is it that he's ruining your life? Well, he's only ruining it because you're letting him. See, the devil only has the power of suggestion. That's all he's ever had all along from the beginning of time. Let's look at Eve. She's our case study. Amen. What happened with Eve? The devil came to her in the garden. And he convinced her to think other than the way God told her, right? He beguiled her. He twisted God's word. He challenged God's word. Yes. easily tempted. God gave us free will, remember? God gave us free will. And because, just like we always say, God could have created robots, but he didn't. God could have, could, could have created, you know, people to worship him without question, but he didn't. He gave us free will because he wanted true love. Don't you want true love? Isn't that what you're seeing? I don't know about you guys, but for me personally, loyalty's big on my list, you know, I want to deal with loyal people. And I want people who are loyal. And you can't find people like that because they're too busy trying to, you know, not make any waves. And the truth is, see, this is, we're coming to a time, Pastor's been alluding to it as he's been preaching on Sundays, especially after the whole decision recently made by the Supreme Court. The truth is, is the world that's ahead of us, the ways of the world, for all you people who don't want to make waves and don't want to stand up and when people start talking and bashing God and saying what we can and can't do as Christians and you just stay quiet, there's going to be a time where you're going to have to speak up. There's going to be a time where you're going to have to make a decision. See, the problem is, is that supposedly you already were supposed to have made that decision. When you received Jesus in your heart, that was your decision. But see, everybody wants to live their lives differently. They're just like, you know what? I took out the insurance policy. I'm getting in. I'm good. They don't want to do nothing else. But the bottom line is God made you for a purpose, for a reason, and you need to figure out what that is, and you need to start walking on it, in it no matter what, no matter who likes it or who doesn't like it. Let's look at Sister Joyce Meyer for a minute. She says, look at, look at what she's accomplished up to now. But in the beginning, somebody was against her. In the church, they told her, women shouldn't be preaching. Women, I mean, you you should be a pastor's wife. You should not be the pastor. 
You know, people have their, but had she let those words affect her? I mean, she says it in her testimony all the time. She tells the story, hey, I tried to be like so-and-so, and I tried to do, but you know what? That's not how God made her. And she discovered, hey, the voice that she didn't like so much. You know, I met a, I met a sister recently. Oh, we were in a roundtable meeting with, the, with Congresswoman uh, Torres. And it's a lot of ministers and pastors. And this one lady, as we were talking about different things, because they got into the homelessness um, topic. And she talked about a program that they had at their church. And she was just sharing information. She wasn't preaching. She wasn't quoting scripture. She was just talking about the program that they have at the church, when they meet, what it's called, you know, how you can get involved or whatever. That's all she was saying. That kind of information would be no different than standing up there and giving the bulletin, letting you know what's going on in the church. But her voice was deep. And she was like, and we meet on Tuesdays <clears throat> you know like that's the way she talked and I was like I sound like Minnie Mouse I sound like Minnie Mouse my whole life it's gotten deeper in my old age <laughs> I don't know if any of the smoking back in the days help but you know what I've always sound like Minnie Mouse okay you hear my little me mo that's how I talk you can't hear her and she speaks really, and then that's me okay so when I hear a sister like that talking I was like I love that well, I'm so glad Ronnie has a deep powerful voice you know so anyways um, I went up to her after the meeting and I told her, I just have to tell you, I love your voice. I said, you know, I would love to hear you preach because I could just imagine. And she just goes, ha, she kind of laughed with her deep laugh, you know, and she says, oh, honey, thank you for saying that. I've always hated my voice. And I've always said to the Lord, why did you give me this voice? Why couldn't I have a sweet voice? You know, she's talking to me, and I'm just like, eh, yeah. <laughs> anyways, poor you, you know. But anyways, all I'm saying is she's a pastor, so she, she's using her voice, and people are being ministered. Whatever your gift is or whatever your purpose is, find it and get into it because God will use it. And you are going to have your haters because I've come across men who will say, <laughs> Chino and Ronnie's not here. So now I've got to get in Chino and Ronnie's business. We always laugh because Ronnie does <laughs> have a deep voice. And uh, she says when she first started dating Chino, he called her first thing in the morning. And so she just picked up the phone. <laughs> and she goes, hello. <laughs> she kind of sounded like Marge Simpson's sisters. You know what I mean? How they have those smoker's voice. And she goes, hello. And he's like, Ronnie? <laughs> yeah. You know what he's like? He goes, you sound like a man, you know. So he was not turned on by her deep, throaty voice. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying some men are out there, and they're not turned on by the deep, throaty voice. But others are, you know what I'm saying? And it doesn't matter, though. You're going to always have your haters. You're not going to always be able to please everybody. But I'll tell you what, I would say if you stick to God's word, you'll be fine. And you will, except that there are haters out there of God. Am I right? So I'm sorry. You're not going to be loved by everyone. So get over it right now. All right? Find out what God's calling you to do and be and walk in it. Okay? And I'll tell you what, he won't lead you astray. Amen? I want to just touch on a couple of things um, since I jumped around a little bit. I just want to share with you because, you know, we started off with an exercise this morning about our thinking. And I mentioned how Pastor was teaching on Wednesday night about our thinking. And I told Pastor, you know, that's fantastic. You've laid a foundation for me that I can come on Saturday when I meet with the women and continue to talk about the way that we think. So that's why I gave you that exercise because I wanted you to realize right off the top that the way that you think now is not always the way that you're going to see things. How many of you want that? I want that too. Because, Lord, we need to keep growing in the things of God. And as you grow in the things of God, your mind will change, and you will have different perspectives, and you will do things differently. And, and, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, not as much today, but I want you to know that, you know, when the Bible talks about changing your mind, renewing your mind, I used to always think that he was talking about my brain, and the way that it thinks because the brain they've often compared it to a computer you know 
what is inside of a computer. I mean, let's face it, we can Google just about anything now. But where did the information that's available to us on Google, where did it come from? It came from somewhere. Somebody put that information on the internet, good or bad, it's there. So how did the things, how did your brain get to where it is? You put that there. Maybe not on purpose, maybe on purpose. But the things that you put in there, okay, the things that you put in there now should be godly things. They should be God's word. You should be referring to God's word about every situation because if you don't refer to God about situations that you go through because you will go through situations, Jesus did say you will have trials and tribulations. So don't think because you're a believer you will not have them or you shouldn't have them or because you're having them you must be doing something wrong. It's not necessarily all of that. But what matters more is how you react to these situations. And how you react is, depends on what's up here. So when I used to read that scripture, you know, about renewing your mind, I thought, okay, I got to change the way that I think. And I didn't know exactly all the ways how to do that. But over the years, I've learned different things through God's word and through different ministers that God has brought. And, you know, um, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning. And so I'm encouraging you ladies this morning to continue to grow and to continue to retrain your mind. That's why the exercise I gave you this morning was so important because I really, really thought that there might be one or two of you who would get the exercise, who would turn it around and really look at it from all different angles because I know that's the way you guys think. So it surprised me when it didn't happen. So that's okay. And, but the truth is most people, you know, they see things one way. And they, depending on how much time they have, depending on what's at stake, depending on whatever, will they de determine and really try to figure out a solution, okay? But for the most part, most people, they won't, you know. So, okay, what I want you to, to know is you guys know the scripture, 2 Timothy 1.7, you should know it because Pastor and I rely heavily on that scripture for a lot of different things, especially for people who are dealing with different situations, different fears in their life. And fear is the root cause of a lot of things. So when, when we talk to people, we always often use this scripture, 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And what I loved about this scripture is that if God didn't give us fear, but he gave us power, love, and a sound mind, that should be how we deal with life, with power, right, with love, and with a sound mind. Now, Romans 12, 2 was talking about renewing your mind. Now, why would we have to renew our mind? Because up to now... A lot of the stuff that's up there is stinking thinking. It's a lot of junk. And how did it get there? We allowed it to get there. You know, it drives, nothing drives me more bananas when I see someone post a Facebook post. And they're meaning well because it, it sounds like a good thing. But I always consider the source. Whatever it is that they're saying to encourage or share with everybody, and it's supposed to be a positive thing, I want to know where did the, what's the source of that. And if it's not the word of God or some man or woman of God who is a godly person, eh, I'm a little leery. I'll give you a good one. Everyone remember Ron L. Hubbard? Who is he? Dianetics or something? I think that's more along the lines of Scientology, right? Well, you know, Scientologists, what they do, and I don't know if pastors shared this before, but you know, because he got to go to a, a mega Scientologist building in the heart of Hollywood and whatnot and get to see how they run their operation and whatnot. And they hook you up first thing. If you want to become a Scientologist, they hook you up to a machine that reads your mind, your thoughts, who you are. It's, it's like breaking down all kinds of stuff because what it's going to tell you is where you fall short in your thinking and what you need to work on to make you be a successful person. And they do this whole workup on you, 
and then you go from there. Well, think about that. That's great because a lot of that is true. The Bible says it right here. Renew your mind, right? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So think about it. They're half right in the sense that they're telling you, your thinking's wrong somewhere, and we're going to help you find out where it's wrong. And then we're going to tell you, have, have you, help you work on it. The problem is, is that they don't acknowledge Jesus first. You see, in the beginning, when I first started, we talked about good soil. We talked about the heart. We talked about how Jesus is invited there to your heart. And that's how the whole process begins of renewing of your mind and being transformed. But see, they're doing it backwards. They're saying, let's tend to your body. Okay? And I, I bring this up because your mind, your body, your brain. Where is your brain? In our body. If, I said earlier, if you were to have a heart attack and your heart was to stop completely and you died, where is your brain? In your body. Where is your heart? Physically, it's in your body. Let me take you to a scripture real quick. Proverbs 23.7. Proverbs 23.7. You guys all know this scripture. Remember earlier I said when I heard the book of um, Romans scripture 12.2 and it said about renewing of your mind, the first thing I thought of was changing the way that I think. But I'm trying to tell you that the way that we think has to do with what we put in. Let's hear this. Proverbs 23.7, it says, As a man thinketh in his brain. Anybody's version say that? Not a one. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? How do we think in our heart if we think with our brain? Mm. I'm going to go deeper on this topic on Sunday. So hang on to your notes. Come prepared. Because we're going deep on this scripture. And you need to go deep if you want to be transformed in your life. I'm going to read you some excerpts out of a book that I happened to come across. And it's so funny because back in the days, you know, I guess it would have, I'm sure it was earlier than that, but in the 80s there was a big, big movement where a lot of self-help books came out. And nowadays some people make fun of self-help books and they try to, you know. But the bottom line is there's nothing wrong with self-help books. All I want to point out is again, consider the source. Who's writing this book that's supposed to be helping you? Because if they're not Christians, if they're not believers, I don't know if I want to believe everything they're saying, no matter how good it sounds. And again, I could go in a whole other direction and give you a lot of examples, but um, I don't have time for that. But if you're going to read anything, it should be the Bible. And from the Bible... People have written many great self-help books, breaking down certain things. And some of us need that, amen? Some of us are dealing with certain things that we need a specialized word. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be based on God's word, but then it's got to be taught so we can change what's going on up here. Um, there's a book. Let me get over to this note real quick. There's a book that I came across by an author named James Allen. Anybody ever, hold, anybody ever hear of him? James Allen? I didn't recognize his name either as an author, but he's a philosopher and an inspirational writer. And you might recognize this book because I remember hearing it back in the, in the early 90s, and I, I never checked it out because like I've shared with you guys before, I don't ever think I need help with anything. No. <laughs> so when I hear certain uh, topics or whatever, I just kind of like, eh, that's not for me. <laughs> we often think that, you know. But anyways, 
when I came across it, I was like, oh, wow. And being what I've been studying lately about our mind and our heart and our brain and our body and our spirit and the whole connection and the whole everything, oh, this just sent me, whoo. I was on a good one. You know what I'm saying? I was happy. But it's all Holy Spirit driven. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, he wrote a book that's called As a Man Thinketh. Anyone ever heard of that book? I've heard of the book, but I really, I just didn't have any interest in it when I first heard it. But now that I know the word like I know the word, it was very intriguing. And when I looked at it, started looking at these excerpts, this, this, it was online, I was like, <laughs> well, this is awesome. And, uh, you know, some of you know I, I had mentioned that I had been reading um, or listening to a lot of uh, Caroline Lee, Dr. Caroline Lee. She's a brain, uh, studies the brain, a uh, brain scientist, but she's a Christian. And the connections there, I mean, everything that I'm hearing, I'm like, yes. And this is, it's just, it's the word. The, the, the word is the source. And so reading these excerpts, I was like, man, I got to share this. I just got to share this. And let me just, let me just read you. I'm going to read you some excerpts out of three different chapters. The first chapter um, of his book, As a Man Think, it's, it's chapter one, and it's called, it's titled, Thought and Character, okay? And it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Not only embraces the whole of a man's being, but is so comprehensive as to reach out to every condition and circumstance of life. How many of you remember the scripture? To guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. That's a scripture. So what he's talking about right here is scriptural. And he said, a man is literally what he thinks, his character being the complete sum of all his thoughts. For those of you who were at our leadership meeting, you remember... Stroman mentioning that where you are today is because of all the decisions you've made up to now. And that's so true. So this is no difference. Different. His character being the complete sum of all his thoughts. You are who you are today for all the decisions that you made in your life. Some of the decisions you didn't make, some of them were made for you. I talked earlier about being in the womb. And some of us weren't born into ideal situations. Some of us didn't have the ideal mom. See, y'all didn't have my mom. She's my mom. You know what I'm saying? Y'all had a different mom, and that's okay. Your mama loved you the way she loved you. But we all got loved different. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, some of the, the choices, some of the things were not our own choices. But some of them, we were there because we didn't know any better. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Let me go on to read this. It says, as the plant springs from and could not be without the seed so every act of a man springs from the hidden seeds of thought and could not have appeared without them what do we say all the time your actions go in the direction of your most dominant thoughts so some of us have hidden thoughts you know what I'm saying? We're here at church and we're speaking Christianese and we're giving hugs and we're saying, God bless you, sister, and I'm blessed and loved and blessed by God and everything's great and fantastic and whatever. Jesus is my savior. But when we go home or we get in our car or we get around certain people, some other hidden thoughts are coming out. Because how many of you know the other scripture, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks okay what is deeply planted and rooted and seeded in your heart eventually comes out of your mouth just because it doesn't come out here at church doesn't mean it's not there other people know you a different way you know what I'm saying um, so hidden seeds of thoughts this applies equally to those acts called spontaneous and, pre -med and, and unpremeditated as to those which are deliberately executed. Act is the block. And you know what? Let me back up on that. You know, we just got to see Angeline's going home. And many people shared at her service how spontaneous 
she was. What a fun person she was. God made her that way. You know what I mean? And she was being who God created her to be. She understood who she was. She didn't apologize for it. She wasn't trying to be something she wasn't. She was just Angeline. Praise God. We need people to be themselves. Okay? We really need you because you play a important role in the body of Christ and what Christ is trying to do. I played that song earlier, Brighter Day, and I teased you guys. I said, you guys are no fun. I, I clubbed with some of you guys. I know that you're fun. I've seen you. I've seen you after you've had a few drinks and you loosen up. You know what I'm saying? And you're you. If that song would have been playing, not even knowing what the word's saying, you would have, you know, if you felt like it, you would have been, you know. I'm just saying, because that's you. I often tell people who drink because, you know, when I used to party and stuff, you know, I hated, I hated to see people being one way when they were drunk and another way when we were at work on Monday. I'm like, back then we didn't use the word bipolar like we use it today. But if we did, I would have said, are you bipolar? <laughs> you know what I mean? Why can't you be who you are? I mean, I understand being who you are and then being it to the 10th power because you, you have a little liquid courage in you. I understand that. But I'm talking about one way and another way you know what i'm saying and it's like crazy but the the bottom line is you don't need that kind of courage to be who god created you to be you know i'm i like to have fun i mean you guys again you know we did that personality thing at the leadership thing um i do i tend to be more excited about life and and about things and i do want to feel the passion and I do want to feel the love and I do want all of that the bottom line is I'm stuck in a world you saw that corner with all those task people they're not bad people they just they don't need to fill all that they just want to get the job done <laughs> and that's a little boring for me I need to fill it and get the job done you know what I mean that's just me and then you've got you saw Elias and Ronnie in their little corner right there <laughs> they are like uh, two peas in a pod okay and again, not bad. We need leaders. You know what I'm saying? We need leaders. We just need them. And then you have the one other little light corner. People pleasers. This one. They don't want this one make anybody, you know. And it's okay. I mean, it's okay, but use it in a godly way. Right? Train up a child in the way that he will go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When I, got, when I realized that I had a strong-willed child on my hands, you know, those of you who know my daughter, and now I have a granddaughter that's a strong-willed, okay, I cried, and I went to my pastor, and I said, <laughs> I know that I lived a sinful life up to now. Why is God punishing me? And he's, he said, honey, God is not punishing you. You're blessed. And he said that scripture to me. You train up a child in the way that they will go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. But what does that mean, training up a child in the way that they go? It means whatever gifts and talents and abilities that God gave them, nurture them in a godly way. Show them how it works in God's kingdom. And believe me, my daughter with the mouth of the south, it's going to work in God's kingdom. She will be preaching. That's going to be her gift you know, that she's going to give to the body. She's just got to work out some things. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with my granddaughter. Because that generation that my granddaughter is growing up in, we need those leaders. We need those people, those movers, those shakers, who aren't going to take it. You know what I'm saying? But for God. I often tell Ronnie, if we wouldn't have become Christians and we would have raised you, you'd probably be in prison right now. Okay? You probably would be. You would have murdered somebody by now. I would have been your cellmate, but whatever. You know what I'm saying? All I'm saying is, you know, there's a place for everybody in God's kingdom. Amen? He wouldn't have made you. Just use it for the good, not for the bad. All right. Let me finish reading this because I do want to close up. And like I said, we are going to dig some more deep on this on Sunday. But let's... let's um, I don't want to go through all of this. I want to jump down to chapter 3 really quick. The title of chapter 3 is, if I could get there, chapter 2 is really long. Okay, it's called Effect of Thought 
on health and body. The body is the servant of the mind. Now let's stop for a second. The body is the servant of the mind. The word talks about this. And we established it earlier when we were talking about renewing your mind. And we were talking about keeping your heart. Or I'm sorry, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The other scripture about as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You got to think about your mind being the essence of who you are at your heart. Okay? So if that's true... Okay, the body is the servant of the mind. It obeys the operations of the mind. See, a lot of people, when they're reading this, they're thinking automatically of their brain. Okay, the thoughts that are there. Okay, whether they deliberately choose or automatically express at the bidding of an unlawful thought, the body sinks rapidly into disease and decay at the command, I mean, of disease and decay. At the command of glad and beautiful thoughts, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Mm. This is a good paragraph right here. Just this paragraph. What I, what I want to say to you, you know, you got to remember we've already established that we were made in God's image, that we were wired for love. This is the way God made us, like him, to love. So doesn't it make sense that when you bring negative thoughts and feelings when your heart gets hurt, right? I've been sharing that a lot. Hurting people hurt people, right? When your heart is hurt, when you at the core are broken down, when you're feeling stressed, when things are really getting to you, why is it that science has found now that there is a link between this and sickness, between this and cancer, where bitterness is connected to arthritis, you know, getting your bones all why you know what i'm saying there's there's a reason and i'm saying you've got to examine your heart so unlawful thoughts unlawful would mean what thoughts that aren't god's thoughts his precepts his commandments his doctrine if they're not that then your body sinks rapidly into disease and decay but the command of gladness and beautiful thoughts, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Disease and health like circumstances are rooted in thought. Sickly thoughts will express themselves through a sickly body. Thoughts of fear have been known to kill a man as speedily as a bullet, as they are continually killing thousands of people just as surely though less rapidly. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get it. Anxiety quickly demoralizes the whole body and lays it open to the entrance of disease. While impure thoughts, even if not physically indulged, will soon shatter the nervous system. Strong, pure, and happy thoughts build up the body in vigor and grace. The body is a delicate and plastic instrument which, which responds readily to the thoughts by which it is impressed. And habits of the thought will produce their own effects, good or bad. Now, there's so much more to say in that chapter, and it's actually a really short chapter, but for time's sake, I'm just going to jump down to the very last chapter, which is chapter 7. So as you can see, this is actually an easy read book. And this book has been in production since 1903. Can you believe it? How many of you know that scripture? God's word stands forever. And that's where he's, he's basing all of this on. He's gone there from the word. So chapter 7 is titled Serenity. Calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. It is the result of long and patient effort in self-control. Its presence is an indication of ripened experience and of a more than ordinary knowledge of the laws and operations of thought. A man becomes calm in the measure that he understands himself as a thought-evolving being. For such knowledge 
necessitates the understanding of others as the result of thought. As he develops a right understanding and sees more and more clearly the internal relations of things by the action of cause and effect, he ceases to fuss and fume and worry and grieve and remains poised, steadfast, and serene. Doesn't that sound a lot like peace? So God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, all power, love, God is love, and a sound mind, peace. How many of you know that they talk about women suffering from PMS? You know what that is? Let's change it. When you're feeling pms -y, let's say, I am PLS. <laughs> Need some chocolate. PLS and some chocolate. PLS, power, love, and a sound mind. How about confessing that? How about getting that word in you? How about getting that to transform you? Power, love, and a strong, I mean, power, love, and a sound mind. The strong, calm man is always loved and revered. He is like a shade-giving tree in a thirsty land or a sheltering rock in a storm. Who does not love a tranquil heart, a sweet-tempered, balanced life? I'll tell you who doesn't love it. The enemy. The enemy doesn't love that. And haters don't love that. They make fun of you. They look at you and go, <laughs> oh, because you're a Christian. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Don't even give those people any mind. How many of you have heard the phrase, if you don't mind, it don't matter? And it's so true. I don't know how many times I had to talk to myself in the very beginning of my walk. And I remember my pastor used to say to the whole congregation, not just to me personally, but I know God was talking to me. Don't worry about what people are saying about you. Don't worry what you think that they're thinking about you. So bottom line is you have no control over anybody. So chances are they're going to think it and they're going to say it. And they've already been saying it. And when you find out, then you get mad. They've been saying it all along. So what? See, it's mind over matter. And I remember having to hear that and getting it. And I'm a lot better person because of it. I'm still not perfect, but I'm on my way, amen? Because in Christ, I'm perfect, and you too, amen? All right, let's all stand to our feet. I just want to pray for you guys. And like I said, how many of you felt that this was got you thinking? Amen? This is good stuff. I have been saturating myself in this for about a month now. And I knew the women's breakfast was coming up, so I thought it'd be a good time to, to touch on it. But, you know, you can only do so much within the hour. Amen? But Sunday I get another opportunity, so praise God. Let me pray for you ladies. Father, we just thank you for all these wonderful women that are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, Lord. And when people say, don't worry, it's in your genes, it's not your fault, I pray, Lord, that they remember what your word says. And your word says that you are our Father and we're made in your image and you made us perfectly. And you made us to be love. So anything that is hindering us, that is coming against us, that our body is trying to dish out at us, disease, stinking thinking, whatever it is, I thank God for your word. Your word. You sent your word and it heals us. And I thank you for that, Father. I thank you that these ladies' hearts are open today to you, Father, and what your word has to say to them this morning. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that teaches us, that guides us into all truth, and the truth makes us free. 
I just pray for peace of mind in everyone's mind this morning, Lord. I thank you for the power, love, and sound mind. I thank you that you didn't give us a spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, amen? Amen. Let me turn this off.